Okay, awesome. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to our career panel. Us today we have Dr. Craig, Ms. McIsaac, Ms. Khan, and Dr. Wen. Um, if you guys would like to go ahead and introduce yourselves and tell us and everybody watching a little bit about yourselves, like you're involved first and everything. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, hi, I'm Dr. Seal Craig. Um, just Seal is fine. Uh, I'm a Society of Women Engineers Fellow. I'm an officer on two not-for-profit boards of directors and one executive council, including the local Society of Women Engineers section and the Western Region Robotics Forum that organizes Cal Games each fall locally. Uh, my career has been as an engineering director in program management, uh, manufacturing, technology transfers, high-tech and aerospace industries, uh, products like Ethernet switches, disk drives, large computers, small computers, typewriters, and spatial. Hi, my name is Ellen McIsaac. I am a FIRST alum. I grew up in Connecticut and I got involved in FIRST Robotics competition um, when I was in high school back in 2005. Um, I was on FRC team 1124, the Uberbots, and FIRST inspired me to become an engineer. Um, I, I had never heard of engineering until I joined the FIRST team and it taught me that you can use math and science to solve problems and apply it to engineering solutions. And based on my experience in FIRST, I ended up going to MIT and studying materials science and engineering. And I have built my career in the aerospace industry. Uh, I started out my career working with jet engines at Pratt & Whitney in Connecticut. And then I moved to California to work for Lockheed Martin, um, working on aircraft and advanced materials. And I have been a SWE member since I was in college. Um, and SWE has really helped me uh, get established in my career and explore different options, find mentors and acclimate when I moved to the West Coast uh, all by myself, uh, 3,000 miles away from home. So I'm excited to talk to you all today. Hi, everyone. My name is Lori Khan, and I am a systems, in systems engineering and integration manager at Lockheed Martin, where I've worked for almost 26 years now. Uh, I'm also a FIRST Robotics mentor for Team 2813 as the Outreach and Awards mentor. And I got involved with FIRST because my oldest son uh, was uh, joined the team at Prospect High School. And after his first year and how, all the excitement that, uh, that and interest he showed in engineering after that really excited me to learn more about uh, getting involved with the team. And so that's how I I got involved there. And uh, uh, with SWE, I actually was not a, a SWE member in college. I studied physics and astronomy. So I came into engineering uh, with my career at Lockheed Martin in system engineering. And then it was a friend of mine uh, who, uh, who introduced me to SWE and invited me to some events. And eventually I joined in uh, back in 2014 and I've been pretty active with, uh, with, uh, with attending conferences, giving some presentations there, and then, and now I'm on the SWEET Outreach Committee. So hi, good, good evening. Um, my name is Dr. Tracy Nguyen. Um, I'm actually a practicing optometrist, and how I got to FIRST, or even the Society of Women Engineers, is actually by my daughter, uh, Madeline, she actually inspired me to join FIRST way, way, way back in 2015 when she was just starting FLL. And that was when the Sweenex Club was uh, launched uh, in 2015. And I was actually searching for uh, role models for my daughter because I noticed that she was leaning toward engineering. And so I signed her up for Sweenex and from there, here I am with the Society of Women Engineers. I'm actually the Sweet San Diego Chair. I'm also on the Societal Outreach Committee with uh, Ms. Laurie there. And then I'm also on the Awards Committee. Now with FIRST, um, I'm a mentor, past mentor for multiple teams, FLL, FTC, and FRC. And I'm also a volunteer. I usually um, just got back from Houston I'm an FTC official photographer there. 
So I get to go around taking photos uh, uh, the whole week. So it was, it was really fun last week. And then last, I'm a judge for um, FRC um, with um, Ms. McIsaac there. We do at the San Diego Regional together. So um, really happy to be here today uh, to talk about two of my favorite thing, which is first and sweet. Awesome. Thank you so much for your introductions. So, okay, first question, kind of like a uh, segue into our next questions. But what specifically about, like, for those of you who were involved in SWE in college or earlier on in your life, what specifically inspired you to go into engineering or into the career path that you chose? And for those, that we later on, what uh, what else led you to your career? Was it first from an early age, or was it was it something else? Was it like a like a subject or a specific class? Just to get to know a little bit more about each um, one of you here. Okay, how about I kick off then? So yeah. Um, so my high school chemistry teacher had recommended that I take a National Science Foundation summer program between my junior and senior year in high school. And it was engineering six weeks. It was a couple states away from where I lived. Um, seven gals, 42 guys. Um, and it's also the summer we landed on the moon. So that tells you how old I am, if you know that date. But uh, I came back and said I wanted to be an engineer. So I earned a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Ohio, the Ohio State University, uh, got married, been married to my husband 50 years, and I earned a master's degree in engineering, mechanical engineering from Cal State Fullerton when, after we got there out of, out of college. And then much later in life, I earned a PhD in education about eight years ago where I studied the influence of FRC on young women's career decisions. So the things that, what did it take to get me there besides the, the degrees was I had supported mentors and friends and my husband, uh, another engineer. So those supportive mentors, friends and SWE, which I've been involved with since I was in college. Um, those are the, a, a lot of the reasons I was successful in engineering and had a good career there. So for me, growing up, I always liked math and science, um, even before I knew it enough to be able to articulate that, but I had absolutely no idea what you could do with that career-wise. Uh, so joining a first team in high school really helped me to understand what it meant to be an engineer and how I can apply those math and science skills. And then the question was, well, what kind of engineer do I want to be? Um, so when I was in high school, I, I went to some programs that were put on by University of Connecticut, since I grew up in Connecticut, that's what was local to me, that showcased different fields of engineering and let you kind of explore what it meant to be in different fields. And um, that's where I discovered materials engineering. And when I was on a first team, I was really interested in some of the design decisions that are around mechanics and materials, strengths of materials, because you've got a weight limit on your robot, right? And um, steel is really strong, but if you build your whole robot out of steel, you're not going to be able to build much robot because it's heavy. Um, or aluminum is lighter weight, but sometimes it breaks more easily. Or like if you drill lightning holes in your parts, um, it can make them weaker and it can lead to cracking. Um, and I've I, at, when I was in high school, I had never seen teams use titanium or carbon fiber, but I've since seen it, right? And questions like that, like how do you get something that's lightweight and strong and durable were really interesting to me. And that's part of the field of material science. It also overlaps with mechanical engineering. Um, but I saw that material science does things like trying to invent new, better materials. And one of those types of materials is composites, taking the best of two different things and kind of merging them together to get something that's better than the sum of its parts. So I thought that was super cool. So I was like, all right, that's what I'm going to go study in college. And material science is a smaller field. Um, not everyone's heard of it. And I was, I was worried that it was a little bit of a risk. So something that I did to help myself and ended up reaffirming my decision was early in college, 
I decided to do undergraduate research, which I really recommend to anyone. Uh, it's a great way to explore different fields. And even if you don't wanna be a researcher for your whole career, you can still learn a lot from that experience. So my freshman and sophomore year of high school, I did material science research projects and I got paid to do that by the school. So that also helps with school expenses. And I was able to see what it's like to work in a research lab. I worked with graduate students. So I learned kind of what it would be like to go to grad school and have a scientific research-based career. Um, and I started out working with nanotechnology. That was kind of the hot field at the time. And I liked the, the professor that was leading that lab. And I learned some really good things that helped me in my career. I learned that I want to be a material scientist, um, but I wanted to work on things that were where it would be easier to see the results and not just physically, but I wanted something that had a near time horizon because the nanotech research, uh, we wouldn't have really seen results for like 25 to 30 years that you could actually apply in a product and go use. There was a lot of development to get there. And I wanted to work on something that was developmental, but maybe you could see where it was going and apply it in a few years. And so that's part of what drove me to my career in the aerospace industry. Um, and SWE was really helpful to getting involved in SWE in college. I got to meet other engineers in other fields who built the support network like SEAL talked about and helped to motivate me and get me through. Um, but there's also a whole professional network of people in SWE. So I got to meet practicing engineers who worked in different career fields and learn about what would it be like to work in the oil and gas industry versus the aero industry, versus biotech, versus automotive, et cetera, et cetera. So meeting real people and hearing about their jobs and getting professional advice from them was really helpful. And I actually got an internship through SWE that led to my first full-time job out of college. Wow, that's, that is so cool, Ellen. It's really great to hear uh, that, um, that pathway. My, my pathway, um, uh, some similarities, but actually uh, very different again, because I, I did not have, I did not study engineering. I didn't, um, and I didn't have, I didn't have SWE available to me. Uh, but for me, what I was also um, loved math and science uh, was good. You know, I was much more drawn to that than, uh, than my English or history classes, which um, I actually took like my history, like during the summertime to get them out of the way. Uh, but for me, I went to space camp and that's what turned me in oh, onto wow. the space industry. I actually went back to space camp. I, you know, went and uh, right before my freshman year of high school. And then I went back after my junior year of high school when they opened up like the next, the next level for high school students. And I was actually there the very first week it opened and they weren't quite ready for us. And so they, um, <laughs> they they didn't have everything they didn't have all of their um equipment in place for us and so they invited us back to come the next year for free so I actually went to space camp patrol three times um and I grew up in Houston close to NASA as well and so I just yeah the space industry I was just very interested in I uh, I was I was after going to space camp I was a volunteer at my um at our Houston Museum of Natural Science they after the Challenger disaster, which happened in 86 when I was in high school, they, um, they established uh, these Challenger centers. And the first one was in Houston uh, in order to expose, uh, you know, because of Kristen McAuliffe, the teacher that didn't get to do, teach her experiments in space and all that, they established Challenger Center as a way to teach children about the experience of going to space, but in a much more, um, you know, a, a field trip type of thing where they got to learn how to, you know, be on the ground, you know, learn what it's like to operate uh, or, or, or rather talk to astronauts. And then, and then you could, you went upstairs and then you got to do some experiments in space. And so, mm -hmm. um, so that was just such a natural thing after being involved in space camp. So I was really excited to study physics. Uh, and so I studied physics uh, in college uh, but what I really loved was astronomy and I was fascinated with astronomy. I really did want to go into, you know, I, I did the research, uh, wanted, I really loved doing the research for astronomy, but, um, but in the end, it just, I, the career path for astronomy was, was, oh, okay, you're, you essentially have to go and be, become a, um, 
you know, go get a teaching job somewhere, go be a professor somewhere. And for me, the whole experience, you know, I feel like I'm more of like a one-on-one -on -one type of teacher. I'm less of a talking to massive audiences and, and all of that. So it just wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't some, a career path that interested me. But again, I was also involved in college. We, we had uh, students for exploration and development of space. So I joined that group and that exposed me to more things happening in the space industry and got me um, interested there. So I've always, I always had like this dual interest in space and in astronomy. And so when I realized the career path in astronomy wasn't something I was interested in, I had a connection to Lockheed Martin from, uh, from graduate school that uh, was able to connect me with Lockheed. And, and so, you know, haven't looked back since, um, since heading down that career path. Uh, but the other thing I'll note is that while I didn't have SWE, I did have um, the support from a, a women's, uh, being at a women's college. I went to Smith College, which was all women's. Oh, yeah. And so having that support from an all women's college of, hey, you can do anything you want. Uh, <laughs> you know, women can lead, women can do all these things. Um, that really set me, you know, on a path of, hey, I can do anything I, I set my mind to. And uh, so... Just a follow-up question for you, Ms. Khan, and for anybody else who wants to answer. Um, with what you said about having the support from going to an all-women's college, were there any, uh, like, were there any barriers you faced, uh, like, just going into this specific field or going into a mainly male-dominated field? Is, are there any challenges that you faced or... Are there any barriers that you had to overcome? And what would you say to other girls that are attempting to go into this highly competitive field? Uh, yeah, I think uh, you're, you're kind of in a bubble, obviously, at a women's college, uh, but it was also part of a five college uh, program. And so I did see, you know, in the astronomy classes that we took, you know, at other colleges, I could see, yeah, it was mostly, mostly male, you know, but there were two other women that were graduating astronomy in my class. Uh, so it, you know, it, it wasn't like the only one. Uh, but yeah, I don't know, I guess those kinds of things just never, never faced me as much. It's like, it's, Certainly things have changed over the years being, um, you know, from when I first started at Lockheed and, and it really was mostly male, but it's like, as you know, the years have progressed, there's been more and more women. And I just feel like there's, there's so much of an emphasis on diversity and inclusion now too, that it's just, um, it, it, you know, there, there's definitely an aspect of my involvement to, to support other women. Uh, I, I, I feel like that's um, an important aspect of it. And so that's why uh, I, uh, you know, I do other things at Lockheed to, um, uh, to support that as well through, um, we have a women's impact network or business resource group that I'm involved in too, that is, it kind of provides that extra support network being at a, um, you know, being at a company that's mostly male, but, uh, but yeah, it's really changed has changed over the years and um I don't know maybe it's part you know partly my personality too that's just uh uh hasn't um you know I haven't been turned off uh, that, that hasn't been something that's turned me off and maybe it's because of the um the boost I got from going to a women's college uh how about any any others like any other of our panelists did you guys feel uh any um any like intimidation just by going into a field that was so male dominated, well, uh, especially like maybe early on in your career? Yeah, I'll throw that out. So, you know, I'm the oldest, I think. So when I was there, I graduated and there were only 600 people that graduated in mechanical engineering that year in the whole United States. I mean, excuse me, you know, 666 women. Um, and so I was one of them. But uh, I was always the only technical woman in the companies I worked for, which were mostly large companies at the beginning. And that was the thing I was going to say to Lori was you work predominantly large companies. But when I finally in later years worked to, um, yeah, that's what I was going to say to Lori still, <laughs> Dr. Wendy needs to share too. But um, it was when I became a director. 
at the director level, I started to experience that kind of thing. And the mm-hmm. senior management levels, I think that that particular area is still very present, in particular in smaller companies. Uh, that maybe not all small companies, just some. So let's let's hear from Dr. Wynn and let her answer the question first. But before we go down further on that path, Pradal. Well, my career path to the Society of Women Engineers, since I'm not, I want to say I'm not an engineer, I'm not an engineer, but I am, I am an educated member for three. And the reason why I am is I truly, truly believe in the work that SWE is doing. And in some way it's a little bit self-serving because um, knowing that my daughter is going into this career, I want to um, enhance it and and make her path easier. Now, she started in sixth grade with FLL, First Labor League. Seventh grade, she did FTC. Eighth grade, she did FRC. And then that was when we noticed she was on a team of 70 and there was maybe 18 girls on the team. And that was when the very following year, when she started at the high school as a freshman, um, we decided that we need to do something. We need to find a way um, that would support the girls on the team. And I think um, bringing the Student Club to Poway High School um, in 2019 when she was a freshman, uh, I think that was one of the greatest decisions ever because it has having three on her side and not just for her, but all the girls on the team has really cemented their uh, desire to, to move forward and go into engineering. Um, and I can give one example. You know, we, you know, we started the club in 2019 and the very first thing we did was go to uh, Sweet San Diego's open house. And the first person she meets there uh, became her mentor and continued to be her mentor for the last four years. So she's graduating this year and the mentor is still by her side throughout the, throughout the four years. My name is Justine Sanchez and she actually uh, created an internship position at her company for Madeline. And just imagine a freshman, fresh out freshman year and you're doing an internship. So the cool. reason why I bring that up is I think that having prospect bringing a uh, Swinex club to your team is a great thing and um, lots of great things can come out of it by being connected with a uh, team professional. So um, I would say that um, the pathway to engineering is really, as a female, is really through three and having uh, the opportunity to go to the conference. Um, our first conference was B19 in Anaheim and I think from that moment on, that really cemented my daughter's desire to go into engineering. So um, I'm hopeful maybe next year we get to go to WE22 in Houston and, and maybe see some prospect students there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I will add that my um, part of what prompted me to to join SWE when I did, in addition to my friend who encouraged me to and, and, and invited me some, to some events, but um, I get involved in SWE and, and my um, passion for outreach now really did come from learning how few women there are that are still graduating with engineering degrees. The fa- it's like in that 15 to 20% range. And that's just way too low. It's just, it's, that's what's impacting why we don't have enough women in companies like mine because there's aren't enough to hire. Mm-hmm. And once I kind of, once I that kind of dawned on me, I was like, oh, hold on, what what's going on here? What's really behind it? And because of the outreach I've done, I have heard stories of of women who have been discriminated against, who have been shut out from things, you know, having to work by themselves because the men on their team don't want to um, don't want to include them. They don't feel like they earned their right to be there or something. And and I never had that experience, but hearing it from these other women, I know that it's a real thing. And that, you know, that, you know, having that support from a SWE network uh, when you're in college is, is, is so critical because 
we, will, we, we, we try so hard to get you interested in engineering to begin with. And once we get to, you, you get to college, we don't want you to be discouraged because you may interact with some, um, with some boys on your team that, you know, that, that, you know, that think differently. And the other reason that Sweenex is, is both for boys and for girls too, is that, I mean, we want the boys to be allies. We want the boys to realize that, Hey, this is, this, this, this field of engineering is for both of you. And, uh, um, we've know, always, it, it needs, we've we need always, to support. <laughs> yeah, we've always had guys since they were allowed, they worked originally. There was men's auxiliary, but when they became part of SWE, which is great, um, you know, we, we always needed men and women. And the thing is on campus, the SWE groups were the ones that were across disciplines. And so we would typically have things that would be resume preparation, job fairs, uh, internship speakers and so on and so a lot of the professional organizations like ASME, IEEE and all these that are very uh, degree focused um, they, you just see that so they wouldn't have that they would just have technology things so a lot of guys would come to our outreach events and, and that we would do those things or not just outreach but our, our events and so on like that and I, I was going to say the other advantage for SWE is the people you meet when you change states. I mean, I moved states several times and it was wonderful to be able to quickly join a section, find other women, predominantly women um, of like interests. And that's really hard otherwise. So you can find new friendships. And so I have friends that date back to college in sweet sections. Um, I remember at the conferences, one of the, the very first conference I went to in Boston in 70, I think it was 72 or 73. I met Admiral Grace Mary Hopper and she's just this notable woman. <laughs> she was hilarious. This is when you could still smoke in, <laughs> in, in places. And she was a smoker. She was a chain smoker. And I just remember her, this little diminutive woman talking about how she coined the word bug, how she actually found this little moth that fried itself on a, on, a, on one of the early ENIACs. And and caused the whole computer to go down. So they called it a bug and hence the word software bug. But hearing speakers like that at the conferences is really inspiring. I'm sure it's really, really inspiring to, it's, it's just cool to be able to hear these things from you guys. I can imagine what it would be like to actually experience them. Um, but yeah, so going a little bit back backtracking a little bit to your guys' careers, um, what do or did you enjoy most about your, your career? And what really brought you to, or like not what brought you to love your career, but like what brings you to continue to love your career, even though you do it or did it every single day for your life, what really kept that? Um, love for your career long or love for your field? What kept it strong? Well, I'll start because I, I thought about this one a lot and I tried to keep it succinct. So what did I enjoy the most? The problems I've solved or the solutions I've led um, solutions for. So that's really the things I remember was the, those problems. And then what did I also enjoy the most is the people I worked with. It gave me a larger worldview. I grew up in Minnesota, went to I barely saw another person of color. Um, it, it exposed me to different languages, different cultures, different perspectives, different religions. Um, I'm a different person today because of that, because of that international experience. And that's the thing I remember and enjoy the most about the career. Is there anything I didn't like with a hindsight of history behind me? I don't think, I, I was driven for decades to always be the best. I had to be the best I possibly could because this, saying goes, you know, women had to be twice as good to be thought of as good, right? And I regret that that level of drive was necessary. And I also think, I think I should have been happier with good enough instead of being the best. Um, thinking back to those hours, I put it. So. So I really like the process of innovation and making new things work for the first time. Uh, I talked a little bit earlier about wanting to be able to see the results of my work, how it applies to something. 
Um, so I've really found my interest in my sweet spot in this, the part of research and development that transitions new ideas to products and gets them to work for the first time before handing them off to let someone else manufacture hundreds or thousands of them over and over, which is important too. It's just not my personal preference. Um, it can be really frustrating working on things where you can't quite figure it out and no one else knows how it works because they haven't figured it out either because you have to go back to the drawing table a lot. Um, but that's also part of the fun. You get to iterate on things and explore and, oh, that didn't work out how we thought it would. Well, let's go figure out why. What's the science behind it? Um, so I, I really enjoy that process of innovation. And when you get something new to work for the first time, it feels so good. Um, so even though it's the same general concept, you know, let's go develop new things and test them and innovate. It's new projects, right? So it's always fresh and new and exciting because you're always working on, you know, some new product, process, material, airplane, whatever it may be that you're trying to make work for the first time. So I, I really enjoy working on that. Uh, but something else that I've grown to like a lot over the course of my career so far is helping other people. Um, I guess I'm somewhat of a, a connector. Like I'm not really an extrovert. But I end up making all of these organic connections with people through things that I do like SWE and first robotics and uh, workplace activities and just having worked on different projects and at different companies. And I like to help connect people with opportunities and connect people with each other to, to solve problems, to help them find opportunities. Um, so I've done a lot of mentoring work and um, I like to help people figure out what's next for them based on their interests and kind of map out their careers. And I'm still relatively early in my career myself, but um, it takes some time to kind of figure out how does the professional world work and how do different industries work. So helping people who are in college and early in their careers understand how does the world work and how do different industries work? What options are available to them? How do they weigh out what sounds like a good fit and get connected with opportunities and people to help make it happen? I think that's really rewarding too, because I feel like I can spread my impact that way and help lots of people. And then they can go on and do the same thing and help more people. Um, so it's kind of like in first, if you do activities to help FLL teams succeed, you help empower them to be the next generation in STEM, right? So it's, it's kind of the same concept. And I like doing that a lot too. So in terms of co career wise, I think we you know, go back to SWE um, with, um, and I actually attended another talk last night and uh, they talked, um, Kelly Hahn, which is SWE San Diego president talked about the hockey stick. Um, and I have never heard of that concept before. Have any of you heard of the hockey stick with engineer where it goes like when they graduate from college, it's up here, lots of engineer. And after five years, it goes down like this and like this, because there's a lot of female that drop out because they, for one reason or another, it's just not for them. And I think those that do drop out is probably those that don't have the support, a strong so a network of support. And I think it goes back to SWE again, because I think that if you're connected with SWE and if you um, attend the annual conference, I mean, I just got back from We Local Albuquerque and I can tell you, even though uh, um, I'm there as a speaker to talk about outreach and stuff like that, and I'm not even in engineering, I was really, really, uh, I, I came out of that conference very invigorated, you know, uh, in, in engineering and knowing that, yeah, I know my daughter's going into the right field and to know that there's support that's right back there, that's there for her, you know? And, and it's back to the fact that this is why I'm in this is because I, I want this engineering field to be um, an easier path for my daughter, you know? And so that's why I'm here trying to get other girls in it because if there's more girls going in, she's not gonna be the only one, you know, so. Yeah, I think uh, 
you know, to answer the question about, you know, what it is about my, uh, what's kept me in my career uh, as long as I, as I have been, uh, and certainly with Lockheed Martin uh, as well, uh, I think what I, what I really like about the systems engineering field is because I, I was able to come into it without needing to have like a, a deep engineering knowledge on any one special field. I was able to come in and, and be able to learn about lots of different engineering fields and have like a, a higher level knowledge. And uh, I do like to problem solve. That's, you know, that, that aspect of it um, is, is really fun. I love, fun, you know, I, I love it when there's a, there's a problem, whether it even be like a, you know, communication issue or something like that, that you need to, you know, get, bring people together to, um, to work out something. Uh, I, I really do love bringing things to closure and, and, and getting, getting all those resolutions uh, in place. And uh, uh, I mean, I already mentioned, you know, why I love the space industry and what, you know, what got me into that. But, um, but beyond that, you know, I really do feel like I'm doing the job I was meant to do <laughs> for my career because it just, it so fits my, it fits my personality, my skills and just, um, you know, what I, what I enjoy, um, what I enjoy getting out of it. And, and in, in the mission, you know, of course, keeps me, keeps me going as well and hearing, you know, all the, um, the success of, that comes out of uh, the products that we build from our customers that um, that's always um, very encouraging to, for me. So, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of the best answer I can give you on that one as far as uh, um, why, why I love it. It's just, it's a, it's a natural, natural fit. I love to problem solve. I love uh, being able to see all parts of it, you know, being able to see how a system comes together. It must be incredibly gratifying to see what you want come to life. It's kind of like, like building a robot. Like you work so hard for six yeah. to eight weeks, and then see you know, for it me, all it's come like it's over life. several years before we get yeah. to life. But yeah, but it's See, the other, sure the other it's aspect of it, though. I mean, though, speaking of the timeline, because I know with the early career folks, it's like. Five years is a long time to be at a company, but for me, five years, um, I, I may be moving on to a different thing at Lockheed Martin. Lockheed is such a big company and I can jump from working something in an early phase to working something in the late phase in my next next job that I, that I, that I choose to work on. And so um, I've been able to kind of get that broad experience working in, in different areas, different teams and, uh, um, and yeah, and actually part of what I really love about my job now, now that I'm a, a manager as well, I've been a manager since uh, uh, July of 2020. And uh, I, I love the, um, the aspect of, of having, you know, helping them uh, with their career development and their career aspirations and help, you know, finding kind of like that right, that right niche of where, where they, um, you know, of, oh, okay, I can, I can give them, you know, I can give them this challenge or something and that, that will help them, you know, figure out what they want to do next. And then I can, you know, and, and so being able to kind of like, you know, plant these seeds with, um, with my team uh, and, and see them follow through and, and, and not being afraid that, you know, yes, I am expecting them to eventually leave my team, you know, and, and that can be a good thing. It's, uh, you know, you want to see people, be able to thrive in their careers and, um, you know, and do what makes them happy. Yeah, that, that's, that's really incredible. It's really cool. Um, going back to Dr. Wen, um, you said that you are an optometrist, not specifically um, an engineer per se. So what would you say your experience has been with SWE not being an engineer, but joining specifically because your daughter is interested in the engineering field. Well, I, I joined SWE back in 2019 as a SWE educator, uh, informal mentor, uh, informal uh, educator per se, because I'm not a, a teacher either, but uh, uh, as a mentor for uh, FSU Teen Spider, um, I'm actually, um, I was the business lead 
uh, mentor there and um, and you know it's been great I mean just just being the business mentor what I actually did was I helped out with outreach and so um, we helped start teams all over San Diego um, and um, what was your question again? <laughs> Um, I was kind of just asking what has like what your experience has been working with other SWE educators and other members of SWE. Oh, it's been great because I think that we all have the same goal, you know, which is um, to advance SWE's mission of uh, encouraging and supporting um, female engineers, you know. And I think that, you know, everywhere you go, you um, find a connection with someone that's weak, whether you're an engineer or not, it doesn't matter as long as you're a member, you know? So um, I think it's great. And um, every high school robotics, first robotics student, um, especially a female, should be a CMEX member. And I say that because why not? If SUI's gonna help you get to where you wanna be, uh, get that support, you know? Have you ever talked to a SUI member and not have any encouragement, you know? You always do. I mean, I challenge you to go to a conference, you know, next year, whether it's a WE local that's near you or if it's an annual one that's, that's in Houston next year, um, you're going to find, you, you, you understand the feeling that you get when you go there because you're part of this membership, part of this organization that is just supporting women and having um, male allies that are there to support you. And I'm telling you now, having a Swinex club on your, uh, on your team um, and having allies join, males on the team join, they really understand um, where, where, where you would need a support. And I go back to uh, my daughter, the first year she was on the team and you know, you have the kickoff and then you've got the design team that first, um, that first 12 hours after the kickoff where you unpack the challenge and all that. And I remember her going home and lamenting that you know, she gave all these ideas but no one recognized her ideas, you know? And so I had to sit her down and I had to tell her, you know, you need to have allies. You need to pull a couple of your friends aside and tell them, I'm going to bring these ideas up. Can you back me up? Because, you know, I think when you have someone backing you up, other people will listen to you. Um, and I'm not saying because you're a female, you're not listening to me, but sometimes it kind of, there's a bias that's there, you know? Well, and there's, so there's a thing, there's a thing that, yeah, we talk about that and, um, at work too. And uh, you can be in a meeting and a, and a female, if you're in a mostly male dominated meeting and a female brings something up and then it gets ignored. And then five minutes later, a male brings it up. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, why didn't I think of that? And so we've actually talked about ways of how, to, you know, if you see that happening, if you're the other female or the male in the room and you see a woman's ideas getting ignored or something like that happening where someone else brings it up, you know, you, you emphasize, oh yeah, that was, you know, that's right. So-and-so brought that up and that was a great, um, that was a great idea. Or if you hear someone being ignored, like, oh, can we get her, uh, her idea? And so that's, that's what being an ally is, at, at, you know, in the work, uh, work environment that, that I'm in. Uh, and, uh, and that, that helps. I actually have a cartoon kind of like that posted in my cube at work where it's a woman with an idea and a man in the room says, oh no, I don't think so. And then the woman puts on a fake mustache and says the same thing again. And they're like, oh yeah, we should do that. So it's a little bit of kind of absurdist humor, but it makes me laugh. Um, yeah. And kind of back on the, the subject from before of what's it like to be a woman in a male dominated workplace? Um, so I'm probably the youngest panelist here. So my experiences probably look a little bit different than some of the other panelists. But I will say, even in the past 10 years of my career, I've seen things change. Uh, when I started working, I felt like everyone that I was working with was literally my dad. There were lots of men and they were all a lot older than me. And 
Um, there was both the age gap and the gender gap where I felt like some of them treated me like I was their child or their grandchild um, because I was the same age as them. There weren't a lot of young people. There weren't a lot of women. There weren't a lot of people of color. And in in 10 years, I've seen that change substantially. Um, There were some times in the beginning of my career where I would actually sit in meetings and count and be like, wow, there's 30 people in this room and I'm the only woman. And Like Lori mentioned, there's still a limit on how many women are graduating from engineering programs, which does limit the pipeline, but but things have changed a lot. And now, uh, without even thinking about it, I've got some teams that I run where I've realized all of the people working with me are other female engineers. And it's not like I went out there and handpicked and said, hey, I just only want to hire women. Uh, But it's it's turned out that way because those were the people that had the right skills. Um, So things have definitely changed a lot. And I think there are more resources and more focus on why does diversity matter? What's the value of it? And how can you be more inclusive and create those environments? Well, first has changed. I mean, when I did my dissertation research in 2014, I mean, I started mentoring a team in 2003. And after six years of mentoring an FRC team, we saw one girl each year, that was about it. And I was like, well, why am I putting all this volunteer time? And my husband and I were lead mentors there every day x hours you know etc and so i wanted to know what was you know whether it was really working what was was this a good program or not and when i did an observation in silicon valley in 2014 i don't remember the numbers without pulling my data up but it was a really low number there were women on the drive teams all girls teams of course had women drivers but you know the, the there were very few women drivers out on the drive team out on the field when I and I since I've been judging FRC for the last few years, Silicon Valley, Monterey, the last couple of years, just the last this year and of course two years ago, as well as virtually last year in the judging, a um, lot more women. I mean, markedly more women on drive teams, clearly in the build, um, and more women mentors. That would be the other comment. 2014, I counted, I think, less than half a dozen on the whole Silicon Valley floor that were female mentors. That has also changed. So those things for first is making a big difference, I think, for young women. Now we need more women of color, uh, male of color. We need more of that. That's our next, I think, our next thing. I think it does make a big difference to have role models that you can relate to. And that doesn't always have to mean looking physically similar, being the same gender, being the same race, but it can help because I will say as a kid, I I mentioned, I always liked math and science. Um, And I used to um, read the, you know, the news about what's going on at NASA. And when I was in middle school, that's when some of the the rovers launched and I I tracked their journeys uh, to Mars and, I, I never looked at all that stuff and said, oh, I'm going to be a rocket scientist one day. I never assumed it was possible for myself. Like at the time, I didn't realize what I was doing, but I, I, in retrospect, I subconsciously ruled out certain options for myself because I didn't see people like me who were doing that kind of thing. And I ended up finding my way onto that path anyway, but I, I never would have guessed when I was a middle school student tracking the Mars rovers that I would be working at an aerospace company in a role that kind of makes me a rocket scientist. And I mean, I went to MIT, there's no reason I should have ever doubted or thought I wasn't smart enough to pull it off. Uh, I did all the right things, but um, I think it does make a big difference to have role models that you can look up to and learn from. And when you have concerns, you can, you know, bounce it off of them and get support and feedback. So yeah, having, having more uh, people of color who are mentoring in first and who are active in different things will make a difference to continue to add diversity. Well, I'll throw in a little plug here that uh, Preetal uh, was on the uh, drive team this year for, uh, for 2813, yep, and along with Hallie, our, uh, who's now our, uh, our club president. And so you don't know how thrilled, I mean, after our team being, you know, all male drivers, you know, pretty much all for so many years and uh, Mm -hmm. um, Hallie made the drive team in 2020 when we unfortunately did not get to go to competition due to COVID, but, um, but yeah, being able to see, um, you know, females uh, driving a robot this year was just, was so exciting for me. The process, the 
the growth in prospect that I've seen, because I've known them since they were formed mm -hmm. um, in this area has been tremendous. Kudos. Thanks. Well, I, I can also add in terms of first, they've, um, they created the EDI, which is the Equity Diversity Inclusion mm -hmm. um, Advisory Council um, a few years ago. And, and I think that is really uh, advancing, you know, just inclusion for everyone um, in terms of bringing um, women to the forefront too, because just like your team um, in 2019, um, my daughter actually said, I want to be on a drive team. And guess what? She was on the drive team because um, she wanted to do it. You know, she wanted to be the robot and she wanted to drive the robot. And, and I think that, you know, just seeing so many other girls, even going to the championship this year and seeing so many uh, all girls team is, is pretty cool. So things are moving along. Um, I do believe there's a lot more that needs to, to go, you know, but, but I think we're in the step in the right direction. Um, it, it's not 50, 50. Um, and my daughter haven't announced it yet, but she might be going to a school that's 40, 60. So, um, I think that's good stats, you know? Yeah. It's, it's really cool to be able to see that more like that there's more girls on the team. There's more like people that are, that like I can relate to, or, you know, it's really cool to see other girls on the team, especially now that we've uh, joined SWE, like um, associated ourselves with SWE Next. It's really cool to see how we're gaining allies and how a lot of the boys on the team as well are, showing interest in the ch in like in the slack channel that we've created so it, yeah it's really cool to see how it's been growing um we only have like eight minutes left which i don't know how that happened because i swear it was like 7 30 like not that long ago but um i guess uh one last question um so how did you guys get involved with FIRST and what is your experience with like FIRST in the roles that you have? Like, for example, um, Dr. Craig, you're involved with the awards. Um, how, how do you, like this question is for all of you, but how do you believe that, um, what, what your, sorry, what has your experience been with that? And how do you believe that has shaped you as a person? Well, I got involved with FIRST after I retired from engineering. I tried high school teaching math, and I did want to continue that. And the school asked me back for their new robot team, would I be a, a mentor? So that's how I got involved. And I told you how I went on my thing. And then somewhere in there, I started doing FIRST Lego League judging. So I've judged FIRST Lego League, actually, for FLL for, I think, 15 of my 20 years with FIRST. And I then um, started, I got, I was, became very active in WRF and we started doing Cal games in 2006 and went on from there. So my involvement has continued to be at that level more in the leadership role, not as a mentor anymore. And that's, that's been my primary thing, either judging or putting on competitions or teaching workshops. I used to do that quite a bit for, for, uh, for WRF as well. And how has it changed me? Well, it pushed me in. I got a PhD at, you know, at the age 62, so there you go. <laughs> Changed my life that way. And it's made me uh, in robotics all the time. So I mentioned I got involved in first when I was in high school. I did um, math counts when I was in middle school and that led me to be a high school mathlete. And it was some of my high school mathlete friends that did this thing called robotics that I was like, oh, that sounds interesting. Let me check it out. And um, the first meeting I went to, I, I saw this robot that other 14 year olds had built and it was as tall as me and weighed as much as me. And I almost turned around and walked out because I was thinking I have nothing to offer here. I can't do this. And I'm not entirely sure what made me stay, but honestly it's changed my life in so many ways. Um, not just the technical skills that I built, but I was really, really shy as a kid. Um, and 
it really brought me out of my shell. It taught me how to communicate. It helped me find the leadership skills that I had in myself and built them. And that's a big part of why I've stayed involved in FIRST after high school. I started volunteering with FIRST my senior year of high school. I helped to put on a local FTC tournament. Um, and in college, I got involved in local events, um, planning and volunteering. I've done almost every volunteer role field reset, team queuing, pit administration, robot inspection, refereeing, judging. There's probably more I'm not thinking of. Um, I've been on the planning committee for events, both on the East Coast and the West Coast. Uh, when New England switched from regionals to districts, I was on the district planning committee. Uh, I've mentored teams at different levels. And then when I moved out to California, I had lots of free time and didn't know anyone. So the two things I went to get involved in were first and sweet. And having moved from Connecticut on the district model, Connecticut's a tiny state. It's the same size as LA County. We had three events there. And I moved out here and California is enormous. And my, my closest event was 120 miles away. And I was like, what is this? I, I live in the aerospace valley. Uh, it's like the capital of aerospace innovation in the US. We have all these companies. We have a bunch of local teams. Why don't we have an event? And there's some other local people who were feeling the same way. So we got together and started a new regional, Aerospace Valley Regional. And actually that's what led me to be a judge advisor. I had been a volunteer coordinator and been lots of other things. Um, but we, we, we identified people to be key volunteers except for the judge advisor. So I raised my hand and said, I'd do that. Um, but besides the ways that first changed me, like I talked about from my student experience, I have so many friends around the world um, from first now. It, it's been a great network, a great experience. Um, and now having been involved as a volunteer and a mentor for so long, it's a great feeling to see the people that you mentor grow up and, and evolve and learn and grow the same way that I got to do as a student. Well, I can tell you that um, participating in first, not as a um, not as a student, but as a parent of a student, has been life changing. And I think also for my daughter and for myself, in the sense that I feel like when you volunteer for first, you're really changing lives, and you're really creating the next generation of STEM leaders and innovators, and really you all because. Um, when my daughter started with FLL, I was in the FLL, FTC, FLC, and then, in, and I didn't do as much as Ellen because I don't have all that technical skills and resetting the, the field or anything like that, but I did do FLL judging for values, um, but I think the most exciting thing is to talk to parents and tell them you can create you can be a coach for an FLL team. And, and the main, my biggest suggestion is it's not a drop off FLL team. You don't drop your kids off, you get involved with the team. And so as a coach, you get all the parents together and it's like, who wants to do whatever? And so you divide the task. And then that's how most of the FLL teams um, become successful is because everyone's pitching in. Um, now, in terms of FL, FTC, FLC, I actually uh, volunteer for first um, global challenge. And I think that has been one of the most exciting thing to meet so many global teams uh, over the years. And we actually traveled to Paraguay in 2019. And I, and I would say that that was one, the, one of the highlight of um, participating in first is to mentor a team from Paraguay and then physically fly down to Paraguay to um, run a competition and then meeting that team that you have been uh, helping out for months on end, physically meet a team. I think that's, that's pretty cool too. So um, um, I would say first is amazing. And then in Sui, the two together is creating um, a spectacular um, thing, you know? And I think, Lori, you should talk about us next. What do you think? 
Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I, I do want to at least add that I did I did also get introduced to uh, first Lego League actually when my my oldest son was in eighth grade, and yes, I can um, attest to the parent involvement and what's required there. And um, I wasn't the lead parent for that, but um, I did volunteer at the event that they had. And so I, that was my, actually, that actually was my first worst involvement in first. And then, um, and then I didn't really know what, what to expect with, with FRC. I did see like the big robots that they, they, they brought from FRC to the FLL tournament. And I was like, oh my God, they built that. That's an, that's a, I just, I don't understand. And then once I saw my son get so into it, I was just like, I gotta go check this. I gotta go check this out. And, um, and yeah, I think it, it, it was because of my sweet involvement in seeing so few girls on the team involved in the team. I was like, hold on, some, some not right here. I, 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 they need, they need more, more female role models here. They need, you know, we need to, we, we need to, to, to think differently and see, see, see what we can do to bring more females on the team. And so, um, so that helped a little bit, but as my segue into SWE next, once I learned more about uh, SWE Next uh, as part of my involvement with outreach with SWE, uh, I, that's how, um, that's what I uh, had been encouraging with the team for a while. And I'm so, so happy that Prital has agreed to be our, is our SWE Next student, uh, student liaison for, for it. And um, with that, I am going to share a couple of slides that I have uh, about SWE Next. Uh, to encourage other people to um, who haven't heard about that to um, to consider uh, to consider SWE Next. So, just a quick um, overview: What is a SWE Next club? SWE Next clubs can do anything, and it, it ties in really nice with First because of of the outreach. Um, First is really big about spreading STEM. You know, starting other teams, but also just spreading STEM to as many as many youngsters as we can. And so, there's an alignment there. Um, SWE member talks. That's what we're doing right now, talking about our engineering and our career tours of local industry. I've had um, members of of 2813 join um, join Lockheed for a for a tour. We've had other um, uh, other tours um, from other uh, sponsors that we've had. So that ties in really well with SWE Next and, um, and then of course the, the competitions, but SWE also offers um, uh, their own challenges as well. And then why, why do we do this? <laughs> Getting back to some of the other conversations we talk about, um, women make up half of the world's population. So shouldn't they make up half of the engineers? Why are there only 10, you know, 15 or 20% graduating it with engineering degrees. You know, we need, we need to get closer to 50% and, uh, and have them uh, in, our, in our companies. And one of the things that I think companies are realizing as far as diversity is that having that diversity and the inclusion of, of the diverse uh, talent that we bring in, that's what drives innovation. You're not going to drive innovation by having people who all look in, in the same and come from the same backgrounds. That, that's not going to innovate the next new product. You need to have people from diverse backgrounds to bring those ideas. And so, yes, be that engineer. Uh, so lastly, um, this is a, a QR code uh, that you can, um, if if you're a high school girl and you are interested in SWE Next, uh, you can scan this and, uh, and use our event code FRC2813 to join SWE Next. So you can join as an individual, uh, don't have to be affiliated with a club and still get a lot of the benefits from, from SWE Next. But, as a, um, um, but if you want more information on how to become a club, obviously um, Dr. Wynn knows, uh, knows a few things about, uh, uh, about being a SWE Next counselor for, for multiple teams. And, uh, and I'm uh, rather new to it, but I'm learning about, um, about the SWE Next club, uh, about starting a SWE Next club with, um, with the FRC team, which like I said, so much of the same, same goals and interests uh, between the two. It's a really great um, combination uh, I believe. So, um, so with that, yeah, thank you. 
<laughs> thank you for thank you, Prital, for moderating it and uh, moderating this panel. And I'll hand it over to you to to close. Yeah, I I had an amazing um, experience listening to all of your experiences, and I got to learn so much about SWE and FIRST and just what we can do to make um, engineering and STEM fields in general more 50-50, uh, hopefully in an ideal world soon, they can be 50-50. And with SWE Next, we can encourage more girls to join robotics teams, um, which is kind of, could be where it starts for some people. So yeah. Um, thank you so, so, so much for agreeing to be panelists. I have learned so much and I hope that everybody else uh, watching this live stream has also gotten a lot of information. Hopefully you guys will join SWE next too. Um, and yeah, that's, that's all for 